Welcome to Global Crossroads. I'm Brian Hall. For our premiere show, I have a very special guest, Zafreen Jaffrey. She's a graduate student at Portland State University. I first met her at a Asian Studies conference, and she was giving a talk on her research on education in Pakistan. And the thing that I liked most about her, it's very hard to describe, but it, uh, it was her overall uh, vibe or manner in which you dealt with us and dealt with the subject matter um, that I found very appealing and um, drew me to, the, to get to know you and to want to talk to you more. Mm -hmm. um, you are interested in doing research on K or the equivalent to K through 12 education in Pakistan, and you focused on a particular rural school mm -hmm. and an urban school. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like you just to say a little bit about what drew you to do that kind of research, why education, you could have done anything, um, why was that appealing to you? Mm -hmm. oh, well, thank you so much for having me, Brian. And why education? Um, it's going to sound cliche, but I really like to learn. And I've had opportunities back home. I um, went to really good schools back home. I got, before I came to the United States, which was in 2004, um, I had a master's in English literature and I had a master's in English language teaching. And I was also teaching at an elite English um, medium of instruction private school in Lahore. Hmm. And when I came here, I knew that there was a disparity that existed back home with regards to who could have access to education. And I felt like it was my responsibility to research that more when I was looking for a, a doctoral program. And School of Education really at Portland State was a good fit for what I wanted to do. And at that time, it was really broad. I wanted to address the educational disparities that exist within the educational system in Pakistan. Um, why I particularly chose the two schools that I chose for my research? I um, was, as I was working on my dissertation, um, and I collected a lot of data on educational statistics, literacy rate, it's almost 60% or less in Pakistan for about 187 million people, and about 50% of the individuals in Pakistan are less than the age of 15. Um, so it's a, it's a very, uh, very limited people, and especially children in the first through fifth grade have access to education. 60% of literacy rate? Yeah, adult literacy is about 60%. And there's huge regional disparity within those numbers. There's huge gender-based disparity. Fewer women are educated than men. Um, so I was collecting all this information for my dissertation and I felt like this was a narrative of despair um, based on the numbers that I was getting. And NGOs were sort of uh, my, my source of light in terms of who was breaking or interrupting that narrative of despair. Mm -hmm. Because the public schools were not functioning really well. Mm -hmm. And the state spends about only 2.6% of its GDP on education. And um, the state cannot address the needs of all the children in Pakistan. So there are pri private for-profit schools and there are private not-for-profit that are low-cost schools. But I really wanted to look at the free schools that are operated by not-for-profit private organizations that cater to children from low socioeconomic background. Mm. And I felt like it was my responsibility because I'm from Pakistan and I've had the privilege and the opportunity to study there in the best schools and then come here to the United States to further my education. So I wonder about this, so you've had like the best schools of Pakistan and then you come to the U.S. and you're now in classes here at Portland State. Um, what is, what strikes you about the differences between the two? 
Mm -hmm. I mean, you did graduate work now in both places. What's, what differences leap out at you? Mm -hmm. I think that back home it was definitely um, for, it was definitely a lot of, uh, a very controlled environment. And it was, my first master's was in English literature and that I say literature is my first love. And, but it was still, we were operating in an environment where the textbooks and the teachers were supreme. I really enjoyed studying in that environment though. Mm. Um, there was a lot of uh, emphasis on memorizing chunks out of Shakespeare or Hamlet or, you know, the prelude or mm. Paradise Lost. Wow, memorization. Uh, mm -hmm. There was stress on memorization. Uh, there was also stress. Uh, our teachers, because I went to a uh, school that's run by missionaries that was started during the British times or in early 1900s, it's a very good, reputable school. And the teachers were allowing us to critique um, the texts that we were reading in class, critique them, think about them critically, come up with questions. But we were appearing for an exam that was set by the Punjab University, mm. which required us to then memorize or um, have lots of information and regurgitate it in an exam, a three hour long written exam. So I was used to, I think, a lot of pressure in terms of uh, towards the end of the year, whatever we've studied the entire year, there's going to be a big long exam. Um, so that was very different when I came here to the U.S. where there's more continuous forms of assessment throughout the term. Mm -hmm. um, for my second master's, that was the routine that we followed because it was a very new program, a master's in English language teaching, uh, which had some grounding from applied linguistics. So that was more continuous forms of assessment. That was also very activity driven where you know, we were working and presenting in small groups all the time. Um, we didn't have textbooks for each of the different courses that we were studying for that master's. Mm. Uh, but here it was, I, I, when I first arrived here, I took a class from a professor at Portland State, Donnell Stevens, and it was about a teacher as a uh, researcher. And she had us really reflect and keep journals, and I'm a lifelong journal as a result of that class. And mm. It was very skills driven and, and competency based and I've just really, really enjoyed my classes at Portland State with a lot of professors because um, this is, it's very diverse. Uh, there are a lot of other international students besides me in the classes and there is a lot of room for experimentation and one, one of the things that I really, really liked about being here was my advisor constantly asked me, what do you really want to learn? And I kept telling her that about education in Pakistan and uh, somehow there was room and space for me to really explore what I wanted to explore, cool. which I felt was very different. So we're gonna, at least for the time being, jump away from education, and um, one of the reasons I thought it would be nice to start with a conversation about Pakistan is because I feel that in the news, in the U.S. media, you always hear superlative things about Pakistan. It mm -hmm. is the most important U.S. ally. It is the most dangerous place in the world. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the things that the people say about Pakistan, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I, but I wondered, as you listen, then maybe you don't listen, but as you listen to or read the U.S. media, um, what do you think is the gap, the biggest gap between um, your experience in consuming the media here versus when you go home and then there you are on the ground there. Um, what do you think uh, is the biggest distortion that we have mm -hmm. given our access to information? Uh, mm -hmm. What are we missing? Mm -hmm. um, I think, Brian, that one of the things that's very striking for me, because I travel back and forth a lot and I spend quite a time back home each year, one of the things that I find very striking is is he, the media here and 
is very, very U.S. centric. And when we talk about countries outside the U.S., we're very fearful. And we're mostly giving information that's not so good about those countries. And the reporting, in some ways, there, there are different shows that you know help to not perpetuate the stereotypes. But the stereotypes are so pervasive and they're so ingrained in the psyche of people that uh, even for the class that I'm teaching right now, if I show a video to the students from Pakistan that is about the media in Pakistan, they find it very, very striking because these are not some of the images that they will see here in the United States. What do you mean by striking? Like, what, was, um, what will they... It sounds like they realized something that they hadn't thought of. So what are they realizing? Yeah, I, I showed them of a video of a TV host that is a cross-dresser and then he, you know, dresses like a lady and interviews politicians, religious leaders, and other. Is this other a seriously taken yeah. person? Well, it's like that, it's not. Like it's not a satire, for example. It is a satire. It is a satire. How seriously that person is taken is debatable. But he's uh, interviewing a lot of very influential people. Hmm. So politicians, people from you know, the opposition, the governing party, celebrities, TV stars, movie stars. So you don't hear that kind of, you don't hear within the U.S. that that kind of conversation is something that can happen in Pakistan. What you hear in the U.S. is that it's a very, very conservative country. It's a failed state, which really infuriates me <laughs> when I hear, hear that, that word. Yeah. yeah, you hear that a lot. Or vir it's an almost failed Virtual state. disaster, right, it's going to yeah. go bankrupt. But I think what people miss is the, the various nuances. There, there are about 187 million people who live in that country. Um, and there are so many people in a very small sa space, you know, twice the size of California, almost twice the size of California. Um, and also we hear a lot, you know, a, a lot of blame. I hear a lot of blame. Uh, without the right amount of contextual information and what is the role of Pakistan in the war on terror, how is this a U.S. ally, yeah. how, did that, yeah. how did that coalition start? There is or, a lot of blame. Yeah. Something that, I, that irritates me or that confuses me is that, and I, I'm curious about what you think about this, is that uh, people, politicians and pundits will talk about the Pakistani government or Pakistani political leaders, um, blaming them for something that happens in the country. Mm -hmm. And they expect a certain level of control, of mm -hmm. like um, overall control that, that one party or that one person could control everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. And it's, that strikes me as something that can't even take place in a lot of countries because the, the things are much more fractious and mm -hmm. um, there's not the same level of control there mm -hmm. as there would be here, for example. Like they mm -hmm. take the, the, the U.S. concept of control and place it on a place where things are much more in struggle and have been for... Yeah. Is that yeah, I think I understand what you're asking. Um, I was having this interesting conversation with a guest speaker in my class yesterday who precisely talked about that point that because of that control that is expected from forces outside of Pakistan uh, and specifically U.S. has been very you know strongly allied with the military dictators in Pakistan because they don't have to go through a constitutional process of getting approval and consensus from a democratically elected cabinet or you know a parliament um, so none of our uh, elected governments has completed a term. This is probably the first government uh, that is expected to complete a term, a uh, full five years mm. after an election. Mm. Uh, so definitely our sense of, I think that a pol the politicians used a lot of blanket rhetorical statements as in... U.S. politicians? Yes. and and how that is viewed on the ground by Pakistanis is, is very, very different. There is an article that Bill Keller wrote for the New York Times um, in which he talks about the actual number of lives lost on the ground in Pakistan as a result of being 
the ally on war on terror. And uh, the civilians, the numbers are huge. The military personnel, that those numbers are also huge. We have received a lot of aid from the United States. Um, but there is a certain point at which you cannot track where the aid went. So even if we are getting $200 million annually for education, um, there is a certain point after which you cannot track where the money went, uh, especially from within Pakistan. And so there is, uh, on the ground in Pakistan, amongst the general population, there is a lot of anger and resentment towards the United States. And not to say people of the U.S., but towards the policies right. that the government that has adopted. We do, we do hear that in the yeah. U.S. media. I think it's very clear that yeah. the reporters always say, I talk to lots of Pakistanis, and mm -hmm. they're all mad. Yeah. And they're mad, and they will get very detailed. The, the, the drone attacks, yeah. people are very unhappy about that, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. such and such. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the economic cost is also exponential. And just just the level of violence in Pakistan with regards to the suicide bombing attacks is just deplorable. And and that's that's not what it was like when I grew up there. Yeah. You know, I was yeah. born and raised there. That that's not what it was like. Yeah. Um so this is speaking of uh fearful, this is a question that uh has stayed with me now for a, a long time and it's about the relationship between Pakistan and India and and I'm not I understand the history mm -hmm. and I understand how wounds heal very slowly mm -hmm. particularly when so many people die mm -hmm. in uh, partition for example um, but I it's still that it seems as if the two countries are very uh, fearful of one another. And I have a harder time, to be honest, I have a harder time understanding Pakistan's fear of India than I do India's fear of Pakistan, because mm -hmm. I understand India's fear of Pakistan from uh, terrorist <coughs> attacks that happen in India. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's not, as far as I know, there's not the equivalent kind of violence that India perpetuates in Pakistan. And I could be wrong about that. So I've always wanted someone to say, well, either Pakistanis are just paranoid for not that much reason, or how do you, how do you understand that mm -hmm. fear from the Pakistani side? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I think that there, you're not, not to sound very defensive of, of being fearful, there's definitely fear on the Pakistani side. And so there, there, there there are historical, there are political, there are military-based reasons for that, and historical, as you know, the partition. But but after partition during the 1971 war, when the present Bangladesh um, was a part of Pakistan and India was between Pakistan and Bangladesh, and when there was a civil war situation in Bangladesh when they wanted their independence from Pakistan, Indian forces supported that For and sure. there was a yeah. war, right? Yeah. Yeah. Pakistan yeah. lost the war in 1971 and 90,000 Pakistani soldiers were taken into prison mm. at that time. Uh, so Pakistan's fearful primarily because of that also. And then it's a two, you know, you know, the, you know about the two nation theory and that it is an ideological state um, that Pakistan was created for the Muslims of the subcontinent right, right, who were right. a minority who felt like right. they would not be able to practice what they believe right, right. within the Hindu majority of the subcontinent. I think a lot of the fear mongering on both sides has been fueled by the media, the state controlled media that we had since it's only in the 1990s when information became so readily accessible and available in terms of private news channels, in terms of the internet. Before that, India had Doordarshan, which is their state-owned, controlled media, mm. uh, their, their TV channel. And Pakistan had the Pakistani television, which is also state-owned and state-run. Uh, so there was uh, propaganda on both sides. And these, in these two countries, they both have nuclear weapons. 
We also have the largest militaries in the world. We spend a huge amount of our budget on defense. Uh, Clearly because you don't spend it on education. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. only 2.6% of the GDP on education versus the defense budgets in both of these countries are very high. Um, we, and the, once again, the economic costs of that conflict are so huge. We have about 30% of the world illiterate. You know, you know, maybe more than 20% of the poorest people live in these countries in the world. Right. You know, and, and the populations are very huge. But I feel, so there's, I told you about the historical reason, and then there has been a lot of animosity on both sides because of Kashmir. That has always been the source of bono contention. And we've had three wars at least, and then the Kargil, uh, which on the Indian side, yeah, yeah well, they'd call it a war that was perpetrated by the Pakistani side. The Pakistani side will give you a different version. Mm. So based on where you start, like where the conflict started for a particular war or for riots, um, where maybe Hindus were killed on this side or Muslims were killed on the other side, based on which side you talk to, they will they'll start the narrative from an account where their population Agreed. or their group was yeah. targeted. Right. You know? I want to get to Kashmir in a second. Yeah. But I just um, when you're talking with your Pakistani friends or your family and someone says something that is clearly fearful of India, I mean how do you what do you, I guess it depends who it is and what your relationship mm -hmm. with that person is as far as respect and, you know, all that stuff. But uh, do you say s things like, oh, come on, like this yeah, is ridiculous? Yeah, I think that I, I, I see that a lot when people are discussing U.S., and oh. <laughs> they'll I say that, nasty things about yeah. the U.S. <laughs> oh, you don't want to hear them. <laughs> but they don't. So much about not India. Not so much about India. Oh, not so much. Is I it mean, a government? Like the governments are more fearful than the actual people? Um, I believe that the governments are definitely more fearful. Oh. Like on the ground in Pakistan, you do not hear as much animosity as you hear in the media, or as you hear from very fundamentalist religious extremist groups. Uh, okay. um, so India is being, the Pakistan I believe has given the most favored nation status to India recently for trade purposes. Yes. So there is a lot of improvement going on. There was an exhibition of the Indian uh, Chamber of Commerce in Lahore recently uh, where people were very excited about looking at Indian jewelry, maybe buying Indian saris. People are very excited about being able to travel to India, mm. especially in my family because my mother's parents migrated from India. Yeah, I remember you said that. Yeah, and I've never visited India. I'd love to go. So, and then the, the on-the-ground animosity becomes very apparent when you're watching a cricket match. Uh, but beyond that, the yeah, people I don't think are... Talk about it very much. Yeah. Yeah, as much as they talk about their resentment towards the United States, unfortunately. <laughs> well, okay, so Kashmir. You know, as you know, uh, uh, someone from Kashmir uh, is going to come to PCC mm -hmm, soon mm -hmm, and talk, and, mm -hmm. and I'll be interested to hear um, how she couches the whole thing. What's your take on it? How, how mm -hmm. do you think mm -hmm. should, uh, everyone should best yeah, perceive? Yeah, you know, my take on it is that uh, it's just so heartbreaking how much of violence uh, it's just such a small place uh, in the subcontinent and how much violence the people of Kashmir have experienced in the loss of lives and bloodshed of both the Kashmiri Muslims and the Hindu Pandits. I just think that it's just um, Manmohan Singh has, sounds very promising as far as he's concerned that you know he's willing to talk to various extremist groups also and and talk to Kashmiri Muslims and, and uh, come to some consensus on how they want to deal with that. I, I think that India needs to retreat uh, the very heavy um, military deployment in Kashmir mm -hmm. and Pakistan really need to back out and stop supporting the insurgency and allow... Do you think that's possible, uh, getting back to this control question, do you mm -hmm. think that the Pakistan military can, mm -hmm. has enough control to say, cool it? Um, I think that the current military uh, command seems to be very different from the previous military commands that we've had. 
specifically in terms of they have not taken over the civilian government so far. That's so remarkable in Pakistan. Um, I think that we have to understand the historical reasons again for why Kashmir is such a big concern for both and India I'm and gonna, Pakistan. And I'm going to, with Naila, I'll cover, we're going to yeah. go back to partition yeah. and yeah. we'll cover the historical. Yeah. And, and I think that, um, I think that it's just not, maybe it, uh, both countries justify their large military payroll because they have this conflict mm -hmm. that's brewing. Uh, but I think that the people of the Kashmir and their aspirations, their voices, they need to be heard. They need to be not silenced. Their uh, economic and social conditions in Kashmir need to be improved significantly. So there is employment for people, there is educational opportunity for people. Mm -hmm so that people have a meaningful and purposeful life and they they should have the ability to say what they want to do for their part of the world and I think that if they want to, I, I don't, I'm not really uh, coming from a political perspective right. on, right. Right. Yeah. you know, where there should be a part of India, there should be a part of Pakistan, they should be left alone. I think that's the decision that people of Kashmir need to make with the two militaries really backing off. Is this is my personal opinion? Right, 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 yeah. right. Well, hopefully you can join us when mm -hmm. the talk sure. that's yeah, coming up in yeah, April. Yeah, and yeah, I'd love to do that. Um, see what she has to say. I would love to hear yeah. you know her perspective. You know what's wonderful is that just in this uh, half an hour period, you probably have, uh, if if like a PCC student or a staff person has uh, stuck with us for this long, mm -hmm. they have probably learned more in mm -hmm. this half an hour than they knew uh, for their entire lives. Mm -hmm. A lot of people know mm -hmm. very, very little about mm -hmm. South mm -hmm. Asia or about Pakistan. Yeah, I agree. And I think that in my work, my, my one of my goals is to really constantly challenge the stereotypes that come out of that region. Mm -hmm. and 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 allow people to see that there, there's, there's so much more beyond the stereotypes of madrasa and Taliban and, yeah. you know, violence and aggression. Osama bin Laden, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, thank you so much for coming today and taking some time out of your Friday. Thank you. Thank okay. you for having me. Okay.